Good morning and happy Sabbath church family. I hope you've all had a wonderful week this week. My name is Faye and it is a pleasure to welcome, it is my pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. It's so good to see your happy faces. If it is your first time joining us or if you're just visiting us, I want to say a special warm welcome to you. We appreciate you and we're so glad that you're here with us today. It doesn't matter how old you are or how much you know about Seventh Day Adventism, um, our church doors are always welcome, are always open, and we hope that you feel at home and that you belong here. For those of you joining us online via live stream or via closed circuit television in the villages, we would love to welcome you here, th here also. Even though we are separated by distance, I want you to know that you are very much a part of the service. Thank you for joining to Thank you for choosing to join us and fellowship with us at Avondale Memorial Church. Church will look different this week due to current COVID New South Wales government restrictions. As per New South Wales government requirements, masks are mandatory and unfortunately congregational singing will not be possible. Please maintain appropriate social distancing from people who are not of your household. This morning I hope that you take away something special from the service whether it's the words from a song the praise and worship team will sing, or whether it's from the message Pastor Stephen McGadies will share. But I pray that each and every one of you will have a blessing on this special Sabbath day. So I'd like to, for you to join us at today as we worship and study the word. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Faye, for that beautiful welcome. And I'd just like to say happy Sabbath. For those who have braved the cold, those who have not been down to the central coast in the past few days, well, last week, welcome. And those who did go to the central coast before last Sabbath, I'm sorry that you've had to stay home today and can't be here, but I pray you'll be blessed anyway. We're going to start our worship in Sabbath school with the beautiful hymn 466, Wonderful Peace. <laughs>
because God gives us that beautiful and wonderful peace, he shines in our hearts each day and we have sunshine in our soul. And may this Sabbath day be a day where you feel the sunshine of God in your soul as we worship him this morning. Hymn number 470. invite you to uh, assume an attitude of prayer as we speak to our God. Our loving, compassionate Father, we, uh, we just thank you so much for loving us and blessing us this past week in so many wonderful ways. And it's just amazing that we as just mere mortals can come before the great creator of the universe and commune as friend of friend. We're so glad that it's, it's, it's the seventh day of the week, the last day of the week when we can come here. It's Saturday, Lord, and, and you've set it apart. You've gifted it to all mankind as a day of rest. It's a perpetual memorial of the time back in Eden when you rested from your, your creation, the beautiful, the gift of the world and everything in it to us. And today as we re-examine in the Bible and in the study of the lesson, may our hearts be open to see where and why we have been caught up in the maddening rush of the 24-7 society. News Pastor Steve to enlighten our minds that we all may see your wisdom in giving us this one special day of the week to rest from our labours. And Father, we ask that you will truly accept our sincere desire to turn away from 
anything that's separating us from you. Please help us to truly repent, forgive us where we've fallen short, where we've sinned, and restore us again to our first love. Revive us again in all our ways and guide us along the straight and narrow path that leads to eternal life and then empower us to show others this pathway. But meanwhile, Lord, some are bearing heavy burdens and perplexities that only you can solve. There's so much suffering in this old world. Bring your, cuff, your comforting presence to all those who are facing disasters and troubles of all kinds. Some are going into delicate surgery. Be with them and give them peace, Lord. And lift up our spirits with joy as you show us the beauty of keeping holy the Sabbath day. And in closing, Lord, it is our deep desire that you will reignite that flame of living fire which shone so brightly in saints of old so that every fibre of our being will be alive and filled with the Holy Spirit and the whole wide world will be enlightened with the glory of the knowledge of our loving God and our Jesus and his incredible sacrifice in coming to earth to die and then be raised again oh, to save us from our sins and from eternal loss. Oh, come, Lord Jesus. Come and take us to be with you where you are in glory forevermore. Amen. Has God ordained Sunday or Saturday as his day of worship? This question led to the humble beginnings of the Seventh-day Movement in North America in the mid-1800s. At the time, thousands of Christians were searching for greater understanding of biblical prophecy. And there was a group in the northeastern United States that had recognized Saturday, the seventh day, as Sabbath, the day of worship. These two pieces, biblical prophecy and the Sabbath, laid the foundation for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In 1863, the New Sabbath Keepers officially organized into a denomination with 3,500 members worshiping in 125 churches. Today, the North American Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church represents more than 1.2 million members, spanning all the way from Bermuda over the mainland to Palau. There is an incredible amount of diversity in this region and that requires different approaches to outreach. Church members here minister to their communities in various ways. Many follow Christ's method of ministry, which starts with mingling with people, sympathizing with them, meeting their needs, winning their friendship, and inviting them to follow Christ. Adventists throughout North America are ministering to native people groups, such as Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and First Nations people wherever they are. In places like Alaska, it can sometimes be quite difficult to reach them. Village life, I would say the one word that comes to mind is very isolated, kind of like a third world country. A lot of kids suffered from alcoholic abusive parents, which is verbally abusive, sexually abusive, physically abusive, and they found safety in the church. And that's what our mission is essentially providing. They're providing safety for kids that have been trying to survive this drug and alcoholic epidemic that's still clutching its nails into the very fabric of Native Alaskan culture and people. The biggest impact that having day camps in the villages gives is showing them that there is a way out of this cycle. Once there's somebody there to show them, hey, this is what love really is like. Because of the day camps, 
they're able to get a way out. We have people that can't afford potable water. They come to this facility to get drinking water. Or they've been involved in the food bank program they started here. Our own personal family has been also a recipient of their humanitarian help for our people. Yes, we have an incredible, incredible backyard. At the same time, we're definitely a mission field. In Northern Canada, the native population called the First Nations faces similar struggles as the Alaska natives. Nunavut is the newest, biggest, and most northerly territory of Canada. It has an immense, sparsely populated area with tundra, rugged mountains, and remote villages that are only accessible by boat or airplane. There is a small group of Seventh-day Adventists in a remote part of Nunavut who have started ministry efforts to reach their neighbors. Your prayers and contributions through the mission offering fuel the work in difficult to reach places like this. Like the early days of the Advent movement, we have an opportunity to share a message of hope throughout the North American division. Thank you for supporting the mission work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now we have the privilege of giving an offering to the Lord for Sabbath School. You'll be interested to know that last week our 13th Sabbath offering given to the Inter-American Division uh, reached a total of $7,340. We thank you. Our offering we give today will be to support mission activity around the world and help pay wages of expatriate ministers we uh, can give our offering in the bag today or there is a place in the foyer or in the breezeway where you can place your offerings or you can uh, give via e-giving which uh, once you've established is so easy so let's bow our heads and thank the lord that we can help in the spread of his word around this world dear lord we thank you for your love to us you gave us a promise and a command that the gospel would go to all the world. We thank you we can have a part. Bless us as we give, and uh, may the funds be used effectively, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
lives are ruled by rush hours, work hours, study hours, medical appointments, social events, binge time, screen time, play time. Everything we do consumes our time. In a world of chaos, where we're surrounded by activity everywhere, how do we actually find rest? How do we find this peace of mind that so many people are searching for? Research shows that we're getting less sleep, spending more time on our phones, and most of us are highly dependent on caffeine just to keep going. The lack of sleep, constant screen time, and the never-ending push for more drives us away from rest. We have faster phones, faster computers, even faster Wi-Fi, but we still never seem to have enough time to just slow down. Our creator knew that we would need physical rest. In his wisdom, he built cycles into our time, day and night, as well as a weekly reminder one day at the end of every week called the Sabbath to offer us physical rest and revitalization. It's a time to press pause, relax, and reconnect with God and our loved ones. God gives us a rhythm of rest so we don't feel so drained from a society that is constantly pushing us. The description of God's resting on the newly created seventh day in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, uses the verb Shabbat, meaning to cease work, to rest, to take a holiday, which is the verbal form of the noun Sabbath. It's an invitation to a free holiday, and you're invited. God wanted to make sure that the invitation would be available for everyone forever. So right there in the beginning, he knit Sabbath rest into the very fabric of time. Before the exodus of the Israelites, Pharaoh accused Moses of making them rest from their labor. Pharaoh tried to enslave God's people to work without ceasing, a literal occupational slavery. But God liberated his people into rest and delivered them into the promised land. Whether it's physical, social, or emotional, rest is not limited to the Sabbath alone. One of the most famous statements about rest is found in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, when Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So will you accept the invitation that God is freely offering you? When our lives get out of the rhythm of rest, we become out of sync with God's design that he has made for us. And it's time for us to escape the slavery of a 24-7 society. Take a breath, breathe in the beautiful air around you, press pause, and accept the invitation to rest that God is freely offering you today. Well, good morning. Diane, I don't know where Diane's gone, but wow, Diane, she's got an amazing voice. She's gone to the kids. She's gone to see her little boy. She's got a beautiful voice, Rosemary. Wow. Thank you, everyone, who's been leading this morning. Thank you, Faye. Did an amazing job with the welcome. It's good to see you here. For those, as Faye said, if you're watching online... Welcome, we're glad that you've chosen to tune in. And for those who were brave enough to leave their homes, we're glad that you've chosen to come and uh, worship with us here in, uh, in the church building. We are beginning a new series of studies uh, today. And for those who may not know, in the, uh, in the Adventist church, we have uh, the year separated into uh, four quarters and each quarter we do a different study, a different set of studies. They're broken into 13 lessons and uh, we're beginning a new one this quarter called Rest in Christ. Uh, the, the good thing, what I like about these studies is that 
everyone in the world uh, in the Adventist church is doing the same study. So here in Australia, in the South Pacific, um, over in the US, in South America, uh, North America, in Europe, uh, through to Russia and China, uh, India, in Africa, all around the world, Seventh-day Adventists are today on the Sabbath beginning this new set of studies and we're all going on this journey together. Uh, so I think that's great. If you don't have uh, what has been called a Sabbath school lesson book, you can easily pick one up, um, just see your, your local church, or there may even be a, a book centre near you where you could pop in and pick one up. So uh, we would love for you to join us as we all go on this journey together at the, at, in this new quarter. Let's take a moment to pray and then we'll get into it. Father, we thank you for another day of life. Thank you um, for rest. As we open up your word, as we spend time in it this morning, speak to us through it, fill us with your presence and lead us closer to you. And Lord, we pray for your children all around the world, wherever they are and whatever may be happening in their lives, may they also find rest in you, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So my wife Susan and I have very different ideas on how we should use our holidays. For Susan, holidays are a time to stop and rest and do very little. Uh, she would be absolutely happy just sitting around the house and doing, doing nothing. In fact, I think if she could sit around in her pyjamas all day, uh, she would be very happy. That's her idea of a good holiday. Um, all she would want to do is just sit, read a book and do very little. I, on the other hand, need to be busy doing something. I can't do that. I will go crazy. Uh, holidays for me are a time to do something or to go somewhere. And if it's the summer holidays, I would be at the beach, if I could, every single day, swimming and running and exercising and just having fun. When we went to Europe a few years ago, I created an itinerary and had something planned for every single day. We had tours booked in and we had all different things that were planned and uh, every day was packed. Uh, our holiday was packed full. In fact, when we got back, we were exhausted because we needed a holiday from our holiday. I loved it. Um, a few years ago as well, we went to Queensland and Susan's brother joined us. And again, I had a full itinerary planned. There was something to do every single day. And halfway through the week, he was exhausted. And he said to me, he said, uh, he said you know, you, you need to plan some days where we just sit in the hotel and do nothing. And I just thought, well, that's crazy. <laughs> Why would you go on holidays to leave home to then sit in a hotel and do nothing? So um, that wasn't going to happen when I was on holidays. Anyway, he's never joined us again for holidays. <laughs> I can't understand why. I'm starting to feel actually that Susan doesn't enjoy going, to ho going on holidays with me. Um, I, can, I, I really don't understand why. But long before I would dash off on some busy adventure... God established a weekly reminder of his love for us as our creator and redeemer. And the Sabbath is a time to stop. As hard as that may be sometimes, the Sabbath is a time to stop and enjoy life with family, with friends, and with God. A day 
to be and not to do. It's a day to remember where we have come from, where we are going. It's a day to celebrate all that God has done for us. So let's begin by having a look at Genesis chapter 2. And if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, first book of the Bible, second chapter, Genesis chapter 2, and we will be reading verses 1 to 3. And I do have some uh, pictures here. Okay, the front screen isn't working, but that's... I'll just turn around. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And it writes there... Uh, This is at the end of the creation week, by the way. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And so instantly for me, a very important question is raised and that is why would God create a day of rest before anyone ever got tired? Because I don't imagine Adam and Eve here were tired and I don't think God got tired. Uh, So let's, if we have the roving mics and if anyone would like to attempt to answer that question, That is, why would God create a day of rest before anyone ever got tired? Anyone want to have a go at answering that question? Carol, thank you. And then Rosemary down the front here. Um, So that we could enjoy it and have intimate fellowship and communion with God. And you can't do that if you're doing four loads of washing or something else. Are you saying, Carol, that you don't find uh, or you don't experience an intimate relationship with God when you're doing the washing? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Carol. They're beautiful. Love that. Thank you. God wasn't tired. He enjoyed the wonderful creation that he had just made. Yeah. Everything was very good and he stopped to enjoy it. Yes. And he stopped so that we would enjoy it. He wants us to spend that time with him and that's what the Sabbath is about. Unfortunately, with sin, he knew that we also needed to rest because we would get tired. But it's basically a day to enjoy what God has done and to praise him and worship him for it. Yeah, thank you. Dorothy, before you say, you know, it's interesting when you were speaking and what you were saying about, you know, God enjoying and us and wanting to be with us. And that's what Carol also said. You know, I see and I observe you with your grandchild, your grandson. And, and even today, you were, you know, as a, as a proud grandparent, were sharing with us, oh, look, he's singing yeah, when the music was being played this morning. Uh, and I, I think as we as parents, we take pride and joy in our children and grandchildren and, uh, and how much more God and how much more does he want to spend time with us. Thank you, Rosemary. Dorothy. Should we doubt what God says? Okay. In that we need rest? Is that what you're asking? Mmm. Mmm. Good comment. Good question. Oh, Pastor Lionel. All we've said is from the human point of view. When I get something new, I want to enjoy something new. And God had just made a new set of beings. And he wanted, he wanted the joy and the blessing of being with them as well. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Chris as well. God is a God of love and um, he gives us rest before 
he expects any duty. We get that chance and in the first instance he gave Adam and Eve the opportunity to get to know him, Mm -hmm. um, to understand who he was, to have that dialogue and contact before he was man was given the dignity of their duty wow wow i love that thank you so much thank you everyone for your comments and i love um that yeah that's so beautiful great thoughts that god begins by stopping and resting with his new creation yeah past uh, lionel i think as humans we function best on a uh, a basis of regulation we're used to doing things in a cycle and God made the perfect cycle the first week. Mm, thank you. Very good, thank you. Thank you everyone for your comments. And so we see there that rest wasn't necessarily just a physical thing. Uh, that's not necessarily what Adam and Eve needed there. And rest often that so many people in this world need is not just a physical rest. It's something often far more than that. Uh, and God offers that to us, and we have that that promise, and uh, it comes around every single week. And God offers that rest, not just physical, but that emotional, spiritual, uh, mental rest that we need. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20, and this is uh, the second book of the Bible here, and this is where the Ten Commandments are recorded, Exodus chapter 20. And uh, I want to just read with you verses 8 to 11. But it's interesting there, the beginning of this one. Um, in fact, I think we just, because of time, let's, we'll just read uh, the first two, 8 and 9, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 and 9. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work. And uh, you can read on uh, a little later there. Uh, But the question that I have is, why does God begin the Sabbath commandment with the word remember? Why does he begin with the word remember? Anyone want to have a go at that? Remember the Sabbath day. Thanks, Margaret. The very fact that we're called to rest on that day, when we're busy, we forget So we need to remember, but also it was very special to God because he wanted to be with us and he didn't want to miss out on that wonderful relationship because that's when we develop our relationship with him and he Mm. with us. So, yeah, it was very important. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. You reminded me as well, one of the things that I like about holidays is that I am home and I can be with my daughter uh, and my wife. Uh, I don't have to rush off. Uh, to work or to any appointments, uh, I can be with my daughter. And that makes my daughter so happy when, dad is, when dad's around. Anyone else want to have a go? Thank you, Margaret. Why put the word remember there? Thank you, Lynn. He doesn't want us to forget. If we tell somebody, remember that, we don't want them to forget it. Yeah, very good. Thank you. And the Israelites, the people had forgotten it, hadn't they? Because they were slaves um, and they lost their identity. They lost so much. And Jesus and God here are trying to restore their worth, remind them of who they are. And he begins with his word, remember. Carol, yeah. I like what the Sabbath quarterly says. um, This would be a day to stop and deliberately enjoy life a day to be and not to do, a day to especially celebrate the gift of grass, air, wildlife, water, people, and most of all, the creator of every good gift, a restful celebration of creation. Yeah, thank you. It's actually quite good. I like that as well. The word remember here... Oh, Margaret, yeah. Just one more statement. Uh, When you look at the whole world today... And you say, remember the Sabbath day, and you think, it's the seventh day. And most of the world doesn't actually worship on the seventh day. Mm. So remember is a very important thing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good comments. Thank you. It's interesting that as well, in the Jewish mind, 
um, remembering is not just about nostalgia. Remembering in the Jewish mind is just is not about oh just thinking and I remember that time. It's more than that. Uh, I want to share with you a quote that I read this week uh, on a commentary, and this is what it talks. This is what it says about remembrance. Memory for Israel is never as simple as bringing to mind a set of feeling or facts. Almost without exception, a call to remember is at the same time a call to action. Israel is called to remember Yahweh in order to remain faithful to him. She is to remember the commandments and keep them. She must remember Yahweh's wonderful acts and give praise for them. She should remember how Yahweh delivered her in spite of her lack of righteousness and be humbly dependent on him. Memory is never passive, but requires an active response to what is remembered. To remember Yahweh is to ground one's life in and on him, and so to draw all of life's decisions and actions out of that foundation. So when we talk about the Sabbath, and when God says there, remember the Sabbath, it's all of those things that you said and you said today, and it's always something that leads to action. Remembering the way that God has led, remembering the Sabbath leads to action. And so when we stop and when we keep the Sabbath, um, it, it's not just to be alone and sleep. And there may be times where you need to do that, and that's okay. But the Sabbath is not just about sleep and physical rest. It means to come together and to worship and to serve each other. And worship is a time where we come together, where we remember God's leading in the past, where we receive power to face the present and where we renew hope for the future. That's what we do in remembering the Sabbath, in remembering that rest as we come together as a church. We support each other. We're a community of faith, a community of believers who uh, care for the needs of each other. We recognise that some people are hurting and as a community of faith, we come together to help that person find rest. And in the healing process of that person, that person is then able to help other people heal. That's what remembering is. That's what the Sabbath is. That's what it means to rest. It also means to care for and to serve each other. Because remembering, as I said, is always uh, an active response to what is remembered. Okay, let's go on. Uh, And when we get to uh, the next sort of section in the lesson, uh, it's called, the title is Running on Empty. And it's all, it's about Baruch. And Baruch was um, Jeremiah's scribe. And... this must have been quite a challenging role for Baruch because, um, you know, according to Jeremiah there in, in uh, chapter 45, verses 3 to, four, uh, 3 to 5, this man went through a time of deep emotional pain. He's distraught as he's recording the things that God is giving to Jeremiah and he's writing them down and he's realising that the judgments of God would come on Israel. And this is breaking his heart. Um, And he's exhausted. He's exhausted. This, uh, Jeremiah, by the way, was uh, written just before the Babylonian conquest of Israel. And just before the armies came and they were taken taken captive. And, and, well, let's have a read. Jeremiah uh, 45... And we'll read verses 3 to 5. Jeremiah is almost just over halfway in the Bible. Uh, It's after Psalms and Proverbs. Jeremiah 45. 
and just verses 3 to 5. You said, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. Thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built I will break down, and what I have planted I will pluck up. That is this whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. But I will give your life to you as a prize in all places, wherever you go. I actually love this, because this is a really, really beautiful picture of God. He sees Baruch in, um, in, in distress, and he says to him, Hey, look, judgment is coming. Everything that I've done, everything that I've planted, I've built Jerusalem. But because of rebellion, they need to be disciplined. And everything that I've built up is about to be torn down. Uh, It says in the lesson there, he was about to uproot it and carry it into exile. This was not what the Lord had wanted for his people, but it had to come because of their rebellion against him. But there was light at the end of the tunnel for Baruch. God would preserve his life, even in the midst of destruction, exile, and loss. And so God comes to him and says, hey, it's going to happen, but you know what? I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to be with you. You'll be fine. I'll take care of you. You will have rest. And I love here that in this, in the midst of what's happening and in this these myths of judgment that God is pronouncing uh, as he seeks to discipline, as, as, a, as a parent disciplines a child, in the midst of all of this, right, God stops everything he's doing and he pays attention to the fears of Baruch and he gives him an assurance of his love and of his care. I just love that picture of God that he pays attention, that he chooses to stop uh, and chooses to focus in on what's happening. Um, And the beautiful thing is that we see God still does that today and Jesus did that when he was on the earth. Uh, When we are physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually exhausted, God hears and feels our cries He feels our emotional pain, the exhaustion that we must go through sometimes as we work through and go through life, especially currently in this COVID uh, pandemic that's, uh, you know, just going through this world. And again, here in Australia uh, and here in New South Wales, we uh, again have come into a series of lockdowns And so in the midst of all of this and the isolation that so many people would be feeling, God says, I hear your cries. I feel what you're going through. You're not alone. I'm with you. And he says, I can give you rest. Just something very quickly. um, In in Mark chapter 5, there's a story of uh, Jairus, And Jairus was a leader of the synagogue and his daughter is sick. And so Jairus takes this huge leap of faith and he goes and he looks for Jesus and he asks Jesus to come and heal his daughter. It's found in uh, chapter 5 verses 21 to 43 is the story there. And so he comes and Jesus says, okay, I'll go with you. And his daughter is about to die. In fact, when you read through the story, his daughter does die. Um, and so you can imagine the anguish and the pain as this, for this man and father has you know, for his daughter and the love that he has for his daughter. He reaches out to Jesus and he says, please come and heal my daughter. And Jesus says, okay. And he goes with him and Jesus walks with him. And on the way to his house, Jesus is stopped by a woman who is unwell. 
And in the middle of this story, verses 21 to 43, right in the middle, verses 25 to 34, Jesus stops and he pays attention to this woman. And she shares with him his life, her life story. And I don't imagine that that was a, a short encounter. I don't think she, she spoke for just one or two or three minutes. She shared her life story and her burden with Jesus. And you know what Jesus did? He stopped and he listened to her. He gave her his full attention. Now, could you imagine Jairus? He's there and he's like, hey, we need to go. My, my daughter is, is unwell. Do, do you not understand, Jesus? She, she's about to die. And you can imagine him, he's so nervous. And yet Jesus stops and he pays attention to this woman. As I said, the sad story is that she does pass away and he, he hears that his daughter passes away. But Jesus says, "Don't hey, just trust. And Jesus goes with him back to his house and he raises this daughter. He raises her back to life. Beautiful story. Have a read of it. But I love there again that Jesus, you know, he hears the cries. He, he heard and he knew what Jairus's need was, but he knew what that woman's need was as well. And he stops and he listens. You know, sometimes when we're running on empty and we're fearful, the answer doesn't come straight away. Jairus had, to, Jairus had to wait for a while. He had to wait for a little while. And sometimes in our distress and in our pain and in our uh, sorrow and hurt and in our fears, sometimes the answer doesn't come straight away. Sometimes like Jairus, we need to be a little bit patient and we need to wait. But the answer will come. And God always provides rest for those who need it. Okay, let's uh, really quickly move ahead. Um, uh, what we also discover is um, in the Old Testament, as well as in the New Testament, there are quite a few different words that are used for rest uh, in the Scripture. Um, I'll just go through to this next slide. Here we go. So we see that there's the word Shabbat, and uh, that means to cease work or to rest. We did, uh, it was mentioned in the video at the start. And uh, there's quite a few words there. Nuach, Shakat, Raga. I'm not really sure how to say all of these. Uh, we need someone here who can speak Hebrew. And Shakab. So there's different words in the, in the Old Testament uh, that are used for rest. And all of them have a slightly different meaning. There is that to cease work, or to rest, to take a holiday, as in uh, Genesis and Exodus. But there's also this idea of settling. Uh, in Numbers chapter 10 there, it talks about the cloud and the pillar of fire and the cloud that covered and rested over the camp to protect the people. And so there's this sort of settling um, there is this idea of having peace in this word rest. There's also in, uh, in Deuteronomy there, the, the word is also used to describe the inability to rest. And that's interesting as well. And then finally, there's the rest as in a rest of death. So there's a lot of different words in the Old Testament that are used for rest. And often what we find is that these, these meanings are varied, as I said, but they all have one thing in common. They imply this sort of inner peace, a sense of calm and restfulness. That's what they're all trying to communicate. And it's trying to communicate the different sorts of an all-encompassing aspect of rest. That it's not just physical but it's that emotional and that spiritual, that mental rest that we all so desperately need and desire. Um, it's holistic, and that's what it's trying to communicate, and that's what God is offering to us. In the New Testament, we see again there's a few different words uh, for rest in the New Testament. 
Now, this is the transliteration, these words. I wish they had them in Greek because I could read them to you properly. Um, but there's a few different words there. And again, in the New Testament, we find the same sort there in the New Testament. But I want to very quickly go to Mark chapter 6. Um, if we go to Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 32, when just coming to the end of our study in a moment. Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 32. And, it's, and it writes there, by the way, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Uh, any version that you have is good. And the best version, Pastor Nim has shared this before, the best version of the Bible is the one that you read. So it doesn't matter what version you have, just it's the best one is the one that you read. That's what Pastor Nim says. So uh, chapter 6, verses 30 to 32, Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. In in this story and in this chapter, there's a lot that's been happening here in the life and the ministry of Jesus and the disciples. Uh, Earlier in the chapter, chapter right at the start of Mark chapter 6, in verses 1 to 6, Jesus goes back to Nazareth and his own people, his own family and friends, they reject him in Nazareth. So this must have been pretty hard for him and his disciples. Then in verses uh, 7 to 13, he sends out the disciples and they go out and this is the first time he sends them out alone to do some ministry and to do some work. And they go out and they heal and and you can read the story there. Uh, They preach and they cast out demons and they anoint people with oil and many people are healed. And then in verses 14 to 29 of chapter 6, Jesus' cousin, John, uh, who's known as John the Baptist, is beheaded. And after all of these things have been happening, the disciples, like all the apostles here, because they've been sent, they come back to Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, uh, we need to go somewhere and be alone. We need to be alone. A lot's been happening. It's been an emotional time for all of us. My cousin has just passed away. He's been murdered. You guys have just been on this amazing experience of healing and casting out demons. And we need time together. We need to be alone. And again, we see this really beautiful picture of Jesus wanting to be with his disciples, wanting to be uh, alone with them, to just sit and to stop to worship with them, to debrief, to talk about what had just had happened and, and to encourage them. And I wonder if maybe Jesus even needed a little bit of encouraging himself, maybe. Maybe he just needed to spend some time with his disciples. The story, As you read the story, they actually didn't really get much rest at all because people keep flocking to them and the people keep demanding so much of them Um, And the equivalent passage to this here uh, is actually John chapter 6. If you read this, uh, Mark 6 and then John chapter 6, it gives you a bit more insight as to what's happening because Jesus feeds the 5,000 here and then they try to make him king. And he says, hey, no, you guys all need to go away. And he needed time alone with his father. So there's a lot happening here. Um, Finally, we get to the story of Cain in back in Genesis chapter 4. In Cain and Abel, and it's it's quite a a very sad, very tragic story because uh, as soon as sin entered the world there in in Genesis chapter 3, in the next chapter, we see things get worse. So sin enters the world, relationships are broken, and then in the next chapter, there's the first murder. And Cain murders his brother Abel. And Cain is made this restless sort of wanderer on the earth. It's found in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 12. It says that he is a restless wanderer. But what's interesting there is 
even in that story of Cain, God extends grace to him. God extends grace to him. Um, and, and um, you know, God uh, gives him, uh, uh, or, or God doesn't allow him to, to be killed. So the story there is even filled with grace as well. And again, we just see this, this really beautiful picture of God. And, um, you know, have a read of that and see how did God show grace to Cain. And it's found in chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. That's a bit of homework for you. But that's the beginning of our study. That's chapter 1, uh, or, or the first lesson in our new series on rest and we're going to discover uh, in this quarter what it means to rest in Christ and all that he offers. I pray that as we together uh, make our way through this study that uh, you also yourself will find rest in God, that you will understand what it means to rest in him. Uh, and that you can confidently rest in him because I guarantee that when you step out in faith and seek him and seek rest for him, he will always give it. Let's have a moment to pray. Father, we thank you that you offer us rest and we thank you that because of Jesus, we have rest. Jesus said, come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. What a beautiful promise that is, Lord. Uh, this morning we want to come to you again, seeking that rest. Thank you for offering it. And Lord, uh, be with your children all around the world today. Lead us, guide us, direct our paths, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.
morning, church. Welcome to you this morning. Uh, this morning I did usual routine um, before backing out early in the morning, get the hose out and just wash down the windows so you can see what we're doing backing out onto the street. No ice yet on the windows, thankfully, but maybe getting close. <laughs> Even though it's a cool morning, it's uh, lovely and warm in the church here and um, good to see you all here. It's, um, we welcome our visitors here today that may be with us here today. Glad to have you here with us in our church today if you're visiting here with us today. Welcome to you if... Um, you are watching on TV from your bedside, also from your lounge room perhaps, or maybe even later on online or, or watching live stream. A very uh, warm welcome to you this morning. It's great to worship God on his Sabbath day and we're thrilled to have you with us today, all apart, every everyone a part of our, our service here today, depending on where you are. Just a couple of announcements uh, today. If you are visiting with us here in person today, um, we're really glad that you're here. You'll find in the seats in, in front of you a we're glad that you are here card, and on the back of that, you have the options um, if you want to fill out your name, if you'd lo like to request um, that the pastoral team pray for you or you would like an elder or a pastor to visit with you, um, you can have a look there um, if you would like. Um, just let me put my glasses on. That's a bit better. Um, does it... For instance, um, I would like to discover God's plan for me, um, to rededicate my life to Christ, to be baptised or rebaptized, to receive an e-bulletin. There's a few things like that, transfers and things like that, that you can use this card for as well. We've just been studying about rest and how important it is in our Sabbath school lesson. Um, and that's going to be a theme for the quarter. Rest is extremely important, and not only for us as well, but for our, our pastors. And we have Pastor Steve Duncan, who's, who's going to um, take some time to have a break, and that's really important, and glad to see that you're actually doing that. Very important not to burn out in our work and that can easily happen in pastoral ministry. So good to see that you're doing that, Pastor Stephen. Pastor Stephen, and we trust that we as a congregation will respect that and there's um, the other pastors and elders that you can get in contact with. So Pastor Stephen will be on break from tomorrow, the 4th of July until the 18th and we trust you'll be refreshed and and come back like spring chicken, ready to go, mate. Um, and also, um, w one of our um, ministers of the gospel is going to take uh, Kira Lee Josie, I think I have her name correct, on the 17th of July. She is down to take um, the church service here in the big church, I understand. And Pastor Lionel Smith, thank you, is uh, stepping in to take the service on that day as um, Kira Lee, I understand, is not able to make it because of COVID regulations and things like that that are happening. It has an effect on a lot of different things that are happening for us and we just want to say thank you to Pastor Lionel and look forward to his ministry in the Word on that day. Thank you and welcome to you all. Thank you, Chris, for your welcome this morning. 
God is good all the time and God looks after us when we are needing rest, when we are hurting, when we are under great distress, God puts his wings under us and buoys us up. So please think of these words as we sing them for you here today, knowing that God has you in his hands and he has you under his wings. He is protecting you as a mother hen protects her chicks. Hymn number 529. of us up the front there's Lyndall Dale on the organ and she was on the piano before we have Dorothy Mills on my left hand side and Diane Hope on my right hand side Diane is my daughter-in-law and the mother of my beautiful little grandson who is going to be one year old on Wednesday so that's exciting and I'm Rosemary Malkovich my faith and I hope your faith has found a resting place in Jesus not in anything of this world but in that which is out of this world God he wants us to live with him forever he has done everything possible for us to be saved there is nothing in his plan which has not been done perfectly 
We are the ones who are the question. Will we accept what he has done and choose to follow him? Or will we choose to say no to God? I pray that the second, the latter, is not what we will do and those who are watching from home or some other place. But may all of our faith be found resting in God. Hymn number 523, verses 1, 2 and 4. church. As part of our ministry focus today, I would love to bring your attention to a couple of things that have been happening. Our first one is our new health July, uh, our new calendar for July. This has been a monthly calendar that our health department has been putting out, led by Magda. She's done an amazing job with this. If you would like to get one of these, they are available at the welcome desk as you uh, leave out at the back of the building. And if you want to know what's on that, she's done a fantastic job of actually putting a Bible verse for every single day of the month, as well as some little check boxes which help us stay focused on our health. Um, references and reminders to go and get some exercise, to eat healthily, to go out and have some sunshine, to be able to enjoy that fresh air and to be able to enjoy that time with God. So if you would like one of these, I'd love to encourage you to head out the back after our service is finished and pick up one of those from the welcome desk. Additionally, regarding our, our life groups, if you would draw your attention to page five of the church bulletin, we have a couple updates in there. The first one is the Singing for Enjoyment group, which I know has been fairly popular, is operating a little bit differently today. In your bulletin, you will have had a handout um, which looks kind of like this. What we're going to be doing this afternoon, rather than meeting in the regular room because of the COVID situation currently, we will be inviting everybody to be joining individually in your homes. At 4 p.m. today, we're going to be just gathering almost together in spirit and singing some different songs together. The program will be starting at 4 p.m. this afternoon, but I'd love to encourage you to join in with that. Um, and finally, with our life groups, uh, in, again on page five of your bulletin, you'll see that the craft and friendship group has been postponed due to COVID. We're looking forward to having that restarting soon. However, the pencil and brush group, which operates on Wednesdays, and the Bible marking group, which operates on Thursdays, are still active, but we want to encourage you to please wear a mask when you attend to those. Thank you very much.
just to give our church a COVID update, the current restrictions for us to adhere to currently is that masks are mandatory uh, indoors when you come into our church building or if you go to plus one in the MPC. So anywhere when you're inside a building, masks are mandatory to be on, as well as when we're on in Sabbath school, uh, they are to remain on. When we go to ask our questions, uh, as they bring the mics, the roving mics, our masks are to remain on as we ask our questions. And just to be mindful that we are live streaming the service, uh, so we don't want to be caught online with people watching and they see us remove our masks to ask a question that would put us outside of the regulations. So just to rem remind our church, masks are mandatory when we are indoors. Outside, we're okay. Uh, also restrictions, part of it, is no congregational singing at this time. And so for next week, because the restrictions are one person per four square metres, that halves the total amount that we're allowed in our building. So the max numbers we can have in our church is 193 and 153 max on the lower ground here. So that's just the current um, update on the COVID. From next week, we will move to pre-registrations for our church services, just so we can make sure that we're adhering to the numbers and get a good handle on counting on who's going to come to our church services. So how that would happen is how we did it previously, where there'll be a number that's available in your bulletin. You can call that number Monday to Thursday between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. and our welcome team will be on the other end taking uh, registrations for the church services just to help us keep an eye on our numbers uh, as we go move along with the ever-changing COVID restrictions for our church. Thank you. One final announcement that we would love to share with you this morning. Can I see some hands who are raised for those who are here? And also at home, you can feel free to raise your hand as well. For those of you who have any kind of connection to our Avondale College, those who've studied there, so those who might have met your significant other there, I know I'm in both of those categories, but we've had some really exciting news happen over the last week, so I would love to draw your attention to the screen to find out what has just happened. Hi, my name's Kevin Petrie and I'm the Vice-Chancellor and President here at Avondale. For over 124 years now, Avondale has been an important part of the work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the South Pacific Division. We are proud of the graduates who have left here to serve in, in all places around the globe. We are really excited to announce that we have just become a full Australian university. And for us, that gives the opportunity to have even a greater impact. We believe that it is the unique identity of Avondale as a Seventh-day Adventist institution that has helped to make it the special place that it is. Thank you for engaging with us. Thank you for supporting us. Uh, we look forward to continuing to share with you in the months ahead our journey and our contribution, the impact that we're making on the students that come here. We're now going to talk to God in prayer. And those of you who can kneel, please kneel with me. And those who cannot, please bow your heads. Father in heaven, Thank you for the privilege that we have in coming here this morning on your holy Sabbath day to worship you for all that you are, for all that you have done, and for what you are going to do. Thank you that through the things happening in this world, we know we can be assured that Jesus is coming soon. Thank you, Father, for the truth that those who are resting in the grave before that day will come forth from the grave immortal, incorruptible, just as you, Jesus, did when you rose from the grave. Thank you that those who are still alive at that time will rise in the air to meet you with those who, raise, who are raised from the dead. 
We praise you for your promises. We praise you for a place where there is eternal rest with eternal life. And the rest that we need in this world, we will not have to worry about forever because we will have it as a natural gift. Father, thank you for the joy that is set before us in this new world that you are going to create for us very soon. Father, help us to always be grateful. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who inspires us and leads us and guides us into all of your truth. Help us to be willing, help us to listen, and please will and do of your good pleasure in our lives. Bless those who are meeting with you all around the world, whether it's in person, in a church, in a country setting, out in the open, whether it is in a home because they cannot come to church. Maybe they don't have a church nearby, but they are worshipping you on your Sabbath day. Maybe they're in a hospital bed or in an aged care institution. Wherever they may be, bless them with a knowledge of your, your presence and the wisdom to understand your word. And be with us as we are here today, worshipping you together as a, as a community, as a family in God. Thank you for our church family here. Bless each one. And I ask all of these things, and I thank you, and I praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for the reminder in prayer, Rosemary, of our hope in Jesus' return and his presence with us. It's now time for our offering. We'll be, um, thank you to the deacons who can come forward to collect our, our offering this morning. Um, and there's also the other ways of giving that um, are up the back in the deacons' room. There's a slot there that you can put your offering in also out in the breezeway and e-giving um, if you're a visitor or, or you're not a visitor and you haven't come prepared for your off to give anything this morning that's okay why not give something today that God finds even more special give your heart to him rededicate your heart to him it's now time for our offering we'll just pray uh, to begin with Dear Jesus, thank you so much for your love for us. Today as we give an offering for our local church budget, I pray that, um, that you will bless it, bless the decisions that are, that are made and how um, the offering is spent. May it um, go towards bringing um, new, new people to know more about you and to blessing the people that you have here in your congregation to continue to trust in you. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.
Thank you very much, Diane, for that song. Beautiful words. When you can't tr trace his hands, trust his heart. Amen to that. Good morning, church. Good to see you here this morning. Happy Sabbath. Have you ever fought against someone or something only to later realize you were fighting the wrong battle. I have many times. I shamelessly share with you that I am a recovering road rager where when people don't drive the way I want them to drive, I give them a little piece of my mind. Sometimes, remember, I'm recovered. I'm, I'm, I'm a recovered road ranger. Uh, I'm no longer a road rager. But sometimes I would drive close to them and let them know, unchristian like, that I'm not happy with the way that they drive. And when I was dealing with this road rage struggle that I had, I realized that it taught me that the battle that I needed a fight wasn't with other drivers because they drove in a way that I didn't agree with, but the battle was within. And so I was fighting the wrong battle. Every time I try to correct these drivers and to you know, have them drive the right way, especially when you're on the freeway, there's two lanes, the sign clearly says, keep left unless you're overtaking. A car maneuvers to the right to overtake but stays at the same speed as the car on the left. It's very frustrating to me. Or sometimes they don't use a blinker. So it can, it can get very frustrating. And so now I don't have to worry about those people because I realized when I looked within myself that there was things in my own life that was the trigger for my anger when it came to the road. And so when I dealt with that eternally, I now no longer rage on our roads. Every now and then I might mumble something under my breath. But I no longer express my anger on the road. How do you know if you are fighting the wrong battle? You know when you are fighting the wrong battle is when you are trying to control other people. Control other people's motivations. This is a sure sign when you know that you are fighting the wrong battle battle. And so I want to show you today through why the old covenant is obsolete and why the new covenant has come and it is permanent. And my reason for doing so is that if you don't understand the transition from the old to the new covenant or even understand the new covenant in itself, you will fight the wrong battles as a follower of Jesus. And so I wish to speak to you on the subject I've entitled, It's All About a Partnership. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, your beautiful Son and comforting Spirit, we thank you for your Sabbath. We thank you that we could be here to get today to fellowship with you. But as we have sung songs that had words that we believe to be true about you and your character, we now seek a word from you. And so, Father, as we open up your word, we pray that your spirit will lead us and guide us and walk before us to eliminate our minds, illuminate our minds to your truth, so that as you walk before us, may we choose to follow you. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. We're going to need our Bibles. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, and we're going to read the whole chapter today. Hebrews chapter 8, and we will be reading the whole chapter. I 
I will be reading from the English Standard Version for today, Hebrews chapter 8. And let's begin our reading at verse 1. Follow along as I read. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for the priest also to have something to offer. Now, if here, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, for when Moses was about to erect a tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 9. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. This is the word of my father. The new covenant that Hebrews speaks of was predicted. And the new covenant was predicted while the old covenant was in effect. And so with Moses, we see in Deuteronomy 29.4, he looked forward to Israel having a heart to understand. In the same chapter, verses 22-28, he predicted that Israel would fail in keeping the old covenant. In Deuteronomy 30, verses 1-5, to he saw a time of restoration. So the new covenant involves a total heart change. The prophet Jeremiah, he also predicted the new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, 31, I'll have it on the screen for you. It reads, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In verse 33, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Notice that God does all the work here. I will make, I will put, and I will write. God initiates this covenant. In talking about fighting the wrong battles, Many Christians will compare the new covenant to the Mosaic covenant, which is God's law, the Ten Commandments. But the Bible never compares the new covenant to the Mosaic covenant. It only contrasts the new to the Mosaic covenant, but it compares the new covenant to the Abrahamic covenant. What do I mean by that? In Genesis chapter 15, we have where Abraham is about to make a covenant with God. 
Now, it's quite a bloody scene, so I won't go into too much of the detail, but God asked Abraham to bring five animals, which are the five animals they offered for sacrifices at the tabernacle. And so what would happen in order for them to come into a covenant together, they they would cut the animal and then place it in two, and they would lie the two pieces side by side, and the two people that were making the covenant would walk down the middle of the two pieces of the, the carcasses, therefore declaring a covenant together. And so the idea behind this gruesome Uh, guess ritual was as the two were walking down the middle in between the carcasses they were looking at this dead animal saying may I not be like this animal if I am to not keep my end of the covenant so when God calls Abraham Abraham is believing that he's going to be walking down the, the, the animal pieces with God to make this covenant but as you read Genesis 15 Abraham doesn't make that walk. He actually is put to sleep by God. Darkness comes over Abraham. And so God starts to comfort him by saying, your people, your descendants will go into captivity for 400 years, but rest assured, I will save them. I will bring them out. And you will grow to be a very old age. And so he's asleep. But then the text right at the end of Genesis 15 says, a smoking, fiery pot and a flaming torch come together and they walk down the aisle to make the covenant, which is God the Father and God the Son. Two perfect beings make the Abrahamic covenant. And the covenant blessings and promises was rendered to or accounted to um, Abraham by faith. So when you look at the new covenant, You can compare it to the Abrahamic because the new covenant was inaugurated by the blood of Christ on the cross, which was made by God the Son and God the Father. And the promises and the blessings of the new covenant can be accounted to us by faith. So the new covenant is compared to the Abrahamic and it's contrasted with the Mosaic, which is the law of God. Get that wrong and you could be fighting the wrong battle the prophet Ezekiel predicted the new covenant as well in Ezekiel 36 26 it reads I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you I will take the heart of stone and out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh 27 I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them Now, Ezekiel is interesting because it gives us a few facets of the new covenant, that God gives us a new heart, God gives a new spirit, God gives the indwelling Holy Spirit, and then God will help a believer to live holy. How can we live holy? Through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. The Mosaic law, the old covenant, couldn't provide any of this. Because the law was about you looking at yourself and the new covenant is about you looking at Jesus. And so God doesn't want us to have rigid rituals with him, but in the new covenant, God is more interested in a partnership with you. So let's look at the differences between these covenants. In the old, it was based on law and and man's faithfulness. The new, based on grace and God's faithfulness. The old was mediated by Moses, the new is mediated by Jesus. The old involved regular sacrifice of animals, the new involved a one-time sacrifice of Jesus. The old had many high priests because they kept dying and and the new ones would step in, and the new had one high priest in Jesus. In the old, atoned for sin temporarily, but in the new, atoned for sin eternally. But we can take it deeper than this. In the old covenant, the ministry according to the word of God leads to death. The new covenant gives life. The old enslaves, the new sets free. The old exposes sin, while the new covers sin. The old brings a curse, the new redeems from the curse. The old lived by works, the new we live by faith. 
In the old, it was only a shadow, but in the new is the reality. The old was written on stones, the new will be written in our hearts. The old was a covenant of letter of the law, and the new is a covenant of spirit. The old covenant remembers your sin, the new covenant does not remember sin. In the old covenant, it was a ministry of death, the Bible or the Apostle Paul calls it, but the new covenant is a ministry of life. And so when the old covenant, when the law was given and the law was inaugurated at Mount Sinai, the earth shook and the earth opened up and 3,000 people were killed. When the new covenant was inaugurated in terms of the the cross, but then the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was given, 3,000 people were saved. The old covenant did nothing for the heart. It didn't write anything on our minds. It just wrote the law on cold stone, threatening anyone who would disobey it. This cold external law, with all its requirements, had no power within it to help the sinner. It couldn't save, it couldn't change hearts, and so it had to become obsolete. And so the Mosaic Covenant was as collapsible as the tabernacle in the wilderness. Under law, God requires. Under grace, God provides. But the question is, well, what is the purpose of the law? The Bible is very clear on this. I don't have it on the screen, but I'll read the text for you. Romans 7, verses 7 to 8. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not, Paul writes. On the contrary, I would have not known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetedness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. In verse 12 of Romans 7, therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So the law tells us where the line is. I was, um, my family and I were renting a place down on the central coast. We were called to serve at the Haven Campus Church, which serves on the school campus, Central Coast Adventist School. And so we were renting in Wyoming, and in this place, it, there was a swimming pool. Uh, and the kids love the swimming pool, but the upkeep of the, of the swimming pool can take a lot of time. And so one day I was out there, and I, my son was out there as well. And we had these little red beads that would fall from the tree. And for some strange reason, my son was decided on this day, he would take these red little pebbles that were falling off the tree and he was throwing them into the pool. And I'm watching him and he just throws another one and and another one. And I'm thinking to myself, we have to go in there and collect all of these red things that he's throwing into the pool. He's not going to do it. And he continues to throw it and throws the red, these red things that are falling from the trees that we had near the pool. Well, I saw him and I had enough and I called out the window and I said, I called out to his name and I said, hey, stop throwing those things in the pool. And he had one in his hand and so he dropped it. He picked up rocks and he started throwing the rocks into the pool. And so I, w- I realized that I hadn't, wasn't clear enough. I said, don't throw those red things. And so he decided, okay, I'll listen to dad. And he started to pick up the rocks and he's throwing the rocks in the pool. So I said, just don't throw anything into the pool. And so you see his disappointment because he couldn't throw any more things into the pool. That's the law. The law shows us where the line was. He didn't know where the line was, so he kept throwing things into the pool. I said, don't throw those red things. He stopped. But then he picked up rocks and he started to throw them in. I told him not to throw anything in, and so he stopped throwing things into the pool. That's what the law does. But why does God purpose the law in this way? The answer we find in Galatians chapter 3, 19, and I'll read it for you. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. In verse 24 of Galatians 3, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. The crushing weight 
of the law and the threat of the law is to put us in a state of desperation so that we would know and run to a saviour, that we would go looking for a saviour. The Ten Commandments have not been done away with. The Ten Commandments is the article in the Old Covenant and it's also the article in the New Covenant. In Matthew 3.15, Jesus says that he fulfills all righteousness. In Matthew 5.17, Jesus says he fulfills the law. In Hebrews 8.10 that we have just read, it reads, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So God wants to take his laws and to put them into our minds and write them on our hearts. Well, how does he do this? Well, the law shows up in human form. It shows up in Jesus a far better representation of the law than the stones given to Moses the law lived out would be illustrated by the life of Jesus Christ and through Christ's life the law is placed in our minds and written on our hearts and here's how he did it in Matthew 5 21 22 it reads I'll have that on the screen for you it'll it eventually come there we go You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raha, which is an Aramaic term of contempt, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Continue on in the same chapter, in verses 27 and 28. It's on the screen for you. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It's not just what you do, but it's what you think. And so the law represented in Jesus Christ He moves it to our minds and he writes it on our hearts by elevating the status of the law. Jesus says that the law said, you shall not murder. And so for most of us, we've never murdered anybody. But then Jesus says, if you just think hatred towards somebody, you have committed murder. If you just say an evil word against somebody, you have committed murder. He elevated the status of the law to bring it into our minds and bring it into our hearts. He said the same thing about adultery. He said, you have heard it said that thou shalt not commit adultery. Most of us have probably never committed adultery. But because he elevates the the status of the law, he says, if you have just thought lustfully, towards a man or towards a man or towards a woman, you have committed adultery already in your heart. In Christ, we have the perfect person, the perfect obedience to the law. He kept every divine precept. The law in flesh is more clearer and it's more understandable. Christ is a living example of God's law. Isn't it better to see it living than just to read a bunch of words on stone? That way, you're not just seeing behaviorally, but you're seeing the motives behind the behavior. Now, the troubling thing for me, though, was, however, was that Christ's living example doesn't help us keep the law any more than the table of stones did. Because we can't keep the law that God gave Moses, neither can we live perfectly like Christ. And so the closer you get to the life of Christ as it's unveiled in Scripture, it will crush you just as much as the law will crush you. The perfection of Christ in some ways was more disturbing and more intimidating than the law of stone. His perfection forces upon us a higher view of the law than we could ever know just by reading it. 
Jesus' perfection or his perfect obedience to God intimidated the most religious people of his time that they killed him for it. They didn't kill him for what he didn't do. They killed him for the intimidation that came from his holy living. And so Christ says, follow me. But we can't. We can't keep the written law. Neither can we live like Jesus perfectly. So then what hope do we have in the new covenant? The answer we find in Hebrews 8, chapter, uh, verse 12. I'll have it on the screen for you. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. God doesn't forget like we forget. God knows all things. God choose, chooses to forget our sin because of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, God tells us that God made Christ sin for us. God can forget our sin because of Christ. The sin that condemns us, the sin that can send us to eternal death, this sin God will remember no more because of Christ. This is only in the new covenant. This is not in the old covenant. God will forgive our transgressions and our violations of the law. This is why the new covenant has come and the old is obsolete. Now in Jerusalem at this time, they had a court of justice. This is where they would bring um, disputes and it would be brought forward to the Sanhedrin. Now if you're not too familiar with the Sanhedrin, I'll, I'll explain it a little bit. So the Sanhedrin was made up of 70 men. And you can see on the diagram there, number two, that's the 70 men as part of the court of justice in Jerusalem. Uh, right up the top there, number one, is the high priest who is the top judge for this court proceeding. And number three of the diagram is the defendant. And so as the case was brought forward in the court of justice, the Sanhedrin would gather, they would deliberate, and they would discuss. You've got the high priest, if, they were, if it was you know, at, a, at a stalemate, the high priest could make the final decision. But here is where the court of justice and any decisions that needed to be made in Jerusalem at this time will be made in this setting. Now, right at the end there, number four in the diagram, you see two, two men there, one on the left and one on the right. Now, these are called scribes. So as they would deliberate against a defendant, if the Sanhedrin decided that the person, the defendant, was to be condemned to judgment, then the scribe on the left would write out the condemnation. The scribe on the right only wrote out the acquittals. So if they made a decision to condemn the defendant, he was guilty, then the scribe on the left would write out the condemnation. If they decided that the defendant was to be set free, then the scribe on the right would write out the acquittal. Why am I sharing this with you? Which side is Jesus sitting on? Hebrews 8, verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying in this, we have such a high priest, one who was seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. He's not writing out condemnations. In the new covenant, he's writing out acquittals for our sins. As you sin, as I sin, he's writing out acquittals. He's not sitting on the left-hand side to write out condemnation. This is the confidence that the Apostle Paul had and why he could write in Romans 8 verse 1 that therefore there is now no condemnation for those in Christ. This is the good news in the new covenant that we have a high priest sitting at the right side writing acquittals for our sin. So therefore, in the new covenant, the law can be our joy. It can be our joy, for we are no longer condemned by it. Christ has satisfied its demands, and when we fail, we accept his forgiveness. But here is where many Christians fight the wrong fight. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. 
Nowhere in scripture does it say fight the good fight of sin. But yet so many people get the misunderstanding of the old covenant and the new covenant and they do their best to fight the fight of sin. We have no business fighting the fight of sin. That's being taken care of. Christ sorted that out on the cross. We are to fight the good fight of faith by doing the things that grows our faith so that we can lean into the forgiveness of God. When we are sin conscious, the devil brings in condemnation and the more we receive it, the more we will condemn ourselves. And the more we condemn ourselves, the more we will be unforgiving toward ourselves and even to others. When we are forgiven conscious, sin and its effects, sickness, hatred, lack or so on, will lose its grip on us we will find ourselves walking in a greater measure of God's grace and blessings. Now, I want to encourage you. You won't be the first person to enter into the new covenant or a covenant with God and made mistakes. You won't, either, you won't be the last to enter into a covenant with God and make mistakes. I make them and I know you make them. But just think about this. Noah... Noah entered into a covenant with God where God said, I will not flood this world ever again, nor would I send a rainbow. And what did Noah do? Noah got drunk and he ran around naked. The term for naked is indecent. Straight after he made a covenant with God. What about Abraham when he made a covenant with God? Aren't we grateful that Abraham never lied that his wife was his sister? This man of faith? But he did. He lied. What about David? When God entered into a covenant relationship with King David, what sin didn't he commit? King David. Yet he was still thought of as a man after God's own heart, even when he committed murder so that he could commit adultery and have a baby out of wedlock. You will not be the first, nor will you be the last, to enter into a covenant relationship with God and get things wrong. But when you do, your high priest is sitting on the right-hand side writing acquittals for your sin. Isaiah 43, 25, God says to you, believer, I will blot out your transgressions. I will rem not remember your sins. Micah 7, 19, God says to you, I will subdue your iniquities and cast all your sins into the depths of the sea. Romans 11:27, 27, God says to you, I will take your sins away. My question to you today is what are you more conscious of? Your sin or the fact that you have been forgiven. The only battle the believer has is to remain in the rest of God to trust that Jesus defeated the devil, the victory is won, your sins are forgiven and we can find joy in the law for Christ has satisfied the demands of the law. So as you live in the new covenant, May you enjoy the blessings and peace that comes with it, which is that your high priest sits at the right-hand side writing acquittals for your sin. May God keep you, may God bless you, and may we always be kind. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, Jesus, your only Son, and eternal Spirit, what an amazing God you are. We thank you, Lord, that as you saw that we could find no hope in the old covenant, as you saw that there was no power in the old to help 
the believer, that you sent forth your Son to bring in a new covenant. And we thank you that in the new covenant, Lord, while the law is still active and holy and just, this time you have given us the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit, given us a power to be enable us to be able to keep the law, not perfectly, but we can do it because of the power that you have given us in the new covenant. Thank you that you are a God that remembers our sin no more. Thank you that you are a God who cast our sin into the depths of the sea. May we take this and spread the good news to bring other people into your new covenant and experience the rest and peace in Jesus that we have found. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.